Nature is full of wonders, from giant deserts, snowy rocks, to enormous seas and beautiful rivers. Then there are animals, fishes, zebras, cows, giraffes, too many to count. These animals are full of patterns, stripes on zebras, curves on fishes, spots on cheetahs. Almost any animal can be recognized by its unique pattern. The question we will ask ourselves in this video is, how were these patterns created? Well, this is a very difficult problem that demands genius to solve. Surprisingly, the proposed solution is a simple mathematical equation which marked the beginning of mathematical biology. But before we look into that, let's first look at the story of the man who discovered it. Our story begins in 1939, at the beginning of the Second World War. At Bletchley Park, United Kingdom, a group of scientists, led by mathematician Alan Turing, worked on a top-secret project, cracking German cipher device Enigma. This was believed to be an impossible task, as Enigma has more than 158 quintillion starting combinations. However, thanks to Turing out-of-the-box thinking they succeed, which by some estimates shortened the war for two years and saved millions of lives. Turing is also considered a pioneer of computer science and it is the first who proposed ideas about artificial intelligence. But this is a story from some other time. Today we will look at his work in mathematical biology. In 1952, Turing published an article titled The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, in which he states, an embryo in its blastula stage has spherical symmetry. It certainly cannot result in an organism such as horse, which he points out is not spherically symmetric. He asked himself, how can from an embryo, which is a symmetrical mass of cells, develop organs such as limbs and eyes at the precise location? He proposes that there are chemicals, for example hormones, proteins or acids, called morphogenes, which react with each other. However, only reaction doesn't give us patterns. Reactors become products and that's it. So he adds a diffusion, which in itself also doesn't create patterns but combining the two does, as we will see later. His work uses a lot of different mathematics, however not terribly advanced one, as Turing reassured in his article. Mathematically speaking, he derives partial differential equation, called reaction diffusion equation, which at the same time describes reaction and diffusion of morphogenes. So what has this equation to do with reaction and diffusion and how these two combined create patterns? To make things simpler, suppose we only have two morphogenes, capital U and capital V. Function U measures concentration of substance capital U and function V is concentration of substance capital V. So, for example, if we have a lot of substance U in a small area, the U will take high values and if we have barely any substance U in a given area, the U will take values close to zero. Let's for a moment forget about diffusion and only focus on the reaction equation. Suppose we have this reaction. Substance U turns into substance V if it meets two molecules of substance V. Substance U is continuously added at uniform feeding rate. A fraction of substance V continuously disappears at uniform killing rate. This can be explained with these two equations. Why is that? Well, it's simple. The left-hand side is the time derivative of these concentrations and describe the rate at which concentration changes. The first term on the left-hand side in both equations describe a reaction when u and 2 v's changes into 3 v's. In the first equation, the term has negative sign, a substance u is consumed. In the second one, has a positive sign, a substance v is produced. The second term on the left-hand side in the first equation describes how substance U is constantly added. This is necessary as otherwise U would simply be used out. The fit rate is given by a parameter F multiplied by 1 minus U. That measures that U is added by a rate dependent on the current concentration which never exceeds 1. To elaborate on that, the more substance U we have, the smallest is the rate in which new substance U is added. And conversely, if we have barely any U, the rate in which U is added is high. The only thing left to understand is the second term in second equation. It describes how substance V is removed by killing rate K. To remove substance V faster than substance U, K is added to F and multiplied by V, since the removal of V is also supposed to be dependent on its concentration. 
So the removal of substance V is always faster than adding the substance O. And if we have a lot of substance V, more of it will be removed and conversely, if you have barely any substance V, almost nothing of it will be removed. Now we understand reaction part of equations. Let's look at the diffusion part. This is called heat equation as it also describes heat flow, which is just a special type of diffusion. Let's try to understand it on an example of heat. Suppose we are looking at a line and the temperature on this line is distributed as in this graph. We would expect that the places with higher temperature would get colder and the places with colder temperature would get warmer. As you can see from the graph, the coldest and the warmest places on the graph are exactly the places where graph curves. How much graph is curved is measured by second derivative, so if the curve is bigger, the temperature will change faster and vice versa. This is the intuition behind heat equation, or as it's sometimes called behind diffusion equation. By blending everything together, we get reaction diffusion equations. Now we understand how equations work, but we still don't understand how they get us patterns. For that, let's look at some simulations. This simulation was made by Linus Mosberg, and it is in public domain. Link to it is in the description. So, we have two substances. The red one, which is the one which is created, and the blue one, which is dying. Here we can change the feeding and the killing rate of these two substances. At the beginning, we only have the red substance. Let's look what it happens if we add the blue one. Because of the reaction and diffusion of these two substances, we get a pattern, a Turing pattern. Let's see what we get if we change killing and feeding rates. Another pattern, and if we change it again, another. It is so amazing that Turing was able to predict that just based on equations and his calculations, as there were no computers at the time. Unbelievable. The question is, is this Turing's mathematical model actually true? If we can choose some parameters in such a way that the system gives us zebra's patterns, that does not mean that nature follows it. Fortunately, Turing did not live long enough to see that the biologists found some scientific data that Turing really was onto something. Let's look at two most notable examples. It has been postulated that a special protein governed the formation of lymphatic vessel in zebrafish embryo. Another example would be in a paper titled On Formation of Digits and Joints During Limb Development, which shows that development of mouse's digits and joints may be a result of Turing reaction fusion system. There are other examples, but the moral of the story is that it is sometimes possible using mathematics to predict the results in areas as complicated and diverse as biology. Today, this is the whole field of science called mathematical or theoretical biology, and it gave up some amazing results in evolutionary biology, neuroscience, biophysics, and medicine. Of course, not all, as there were many giants, but a lot thanks to one of the smartest men in the 20th century, Alan Turing.